Quantum computing can seem confusing at first. Strange circuit diagrams, complex equations, cats that are alive and dead at the same time. But what if I told you that this equation and this diagram mean the exact same thing? By the end of this video, you'll see that it's all just vectors and matrices. And even if you've never taken linear algebra, I will explain everything visually and intuitively. Just as we'd start explaining a computer with bits, we'll start explaining quantum computers with qubits. Instead of being a single number, a qubit is a vector in 2D space. Now, it's important to note here that just because our qubit is a vector, it is not automatically in any type of superposition. Those ideas will be introduced in a moment, but neither of those concepts apply yet. Instead, it means that on a 2D coordinate system, we can think of the 0 qubit and the 1 qubit as being basis vectors, like i hat and j hat. So why is this all useful? What does it mean for a qubit to be a vector? Well, one thing that we can do with qubits is measure them. So let's move our qubit along a wire and measure it at the end. If we measure a zero ket, the result will always be a zero. Likewise, measuring a one ket will always result in a one. In terms of probability, we can think of this as the probability of getting a zero given a zero ket is one. The probability of getting a one given a one ket is also one. So now let's revisit the idea of superposition. I'm sure you know about Schrodinger's cat. The idea that flipping a switch will cause some quantum cat to become both dead and alive at the same time. And when you check the cat, it collapses to being either dead or alive. So can we put our qubit in a superposition? Well, the answer is yes. There is a quantum logic gate that can put our qubit in a superposition. It's called the Hadamard gate. You might be quick to notice that there is no Hadamard gate for normal computers, and that's true, but remember that we are working with an entirely new paradigm based on quantum mechanics, so we're working with completely new ideas, and that means new logic gates as well. This is the associated matrix for the Hadamard gate. It looks a bit scary at first, at least that's what I thought, but let's see what happens mathematically when we apply this on our qubit. At first, this result might not make a lot of sense. Didn't we just say that we have two qubits, our 0 ket and 1 ket? How did we end up with a 2D vector with both entries being 1? Well, let's try to use our qubits as basis vectors. Applying some rules of linear algebra, we arrive at this equation, and this is what it means for our qubit to be in a superposition. These coefficients of the 0 ket and 1 ket are called amplitudes, and you can think of them as related to the probability of getting that result when you measure the qubit. If we take the absolute value and square it, that gives us the probability of getting that measurement. This is called the normalization constraint. It ensures that the total probability is exactly 1. Anything different is a logical contradiction. You might notice that this equation looks like that of a unit circle with radius 1, and that's exactly what's going on here. Our two amplitudes are acting like coordinates, and since we're squaring them to get probability, we end up with a unit circle. I really can't describe just how important it is that whatever state we have must lie on the circle. If we end up inside the circle, we somehow got a total probability less than 1. If we ended up on the outside, we somehow got a total probability more than 1. So whenever we use a quantum logic gate on our qubits, regardless of what their current state is, the new state must also be exactly on the circle. This condition of matrices is called being unitary, and it's represented by this equation, where A is any matrix that can be a quantum logic gate. This sort up here has a lot of names. It's commonly referred to as the dagger operation, the Hermitian adjoint, or what I prefer, the complex transpose. And this is its definition. Okay, that might not have cleared things up. The transpose may be obvious, but what does this asterisk mean? Well, this asterisk means to take the complex conjugate, and all that means is if we have a complex number, we flip the sign. 2i becomes negative 2i. If we have real numbers, which is what we're working with so far, then we just don't do anything. So back to the definition of a unitary matrix. This i over here is just the identity matrix. Any matrix, or even any number, times the identity matrix is just itself again. For larger matrices, it's just zeros in all entries with ones in the diagonal. So let's check if the Hadamard gates matrix is unitary.
As expected, it is in fact unitary, since the left-hand side equals the identity matrix. There are other useful gates represented as matrices. For example, the NOT gate, which we use the symbol X to represent, is just this matrix. Just like how the classical NOT gate flips a bit, the X gate flips a qubit. We can see it in action working on both the 0 ket and the 1 ket mathematically. There are other quantum logic gates as well that can act on a single qubit, but to understand how we can implement quantum algorithms, we'll need more than just one qubit. But before we do that, let's do a quick recap so far. For a single qubit, we can either have a 0 ket, a 1 ket, or some superposition of them. We can apply quantum logic gates on our qubit, as long as that quantum logic gate can be represented by a unitary matrix, so that our qubit always lands on a unit circle of 1, which is necessary so that our probabilities always sum up to 1. So far, we've been working with just one qubit, but we can indeed add a second qubit below our first. With our two qubits, we can have four possible basis vectors. But what do these symbols mean? They aren't qubits because, well, they're two qubits. Let's take a closer look at the 0, 0 ket. We can rewrite this as the 0 ket, then this funny looking x inside a circle performed on another 0 ket. What this operation does is it multiplies each element of the first vector by the entirety of the second vector. So applying our definitions of the zero ket, then multiplying both of the zero ket's elements by another zero ket, and expanding, we get this new vector with a 1 in the first entry. If you repeat this process for the other three possible vectors, you'll see that this 1 shifts downwards. This is because for each of the basis vectors, it is entirely pointing in that basis vector's direction. It isn't in between any of them, though it could be as we'll see in a moment. This x inside a circle is called a tensor product, and you will see this often in quantum computing to represent every possible combination. When working with two qubits, the normalization condition also changes. Remember that the squared probability associated with each ket must equal 1. So if we're working with four possible kets, then there are four coefficients for each one. Of course, some of those kets can be zero. For example, this equation represents a 0% chance of our state collapsing into a 1-0 or a 0-1, but a 50-50 of getting either a 0-0 or a 1-1. Let's apply something you've probably already heard of, quantum entanglement. Since we now have two qubits, is it possible that measuring the first qubit will instantly tell us where the other qubit is? The answer is yes. Let's put our first qubit in a superposition by applying the Hadamard gate. Next, we'll use a two-qubit quantum logic gate called controlled knot. I'll explain this more in just a moment. Let's run this circuit 100 times with both our qubits being the zero ket. All 100 shots resulted in a roughly 50-50 chance of getting either a 0-0 or a 1-1, but never a 0-1 or a 1-0. And this is the first piece of the puzzle. The quantum circuit shown at the beginning of the video is just this circuit. It puts the first qubit in a superposition then entangles it with the second qubit. So technically, both our qubits are in a superposition, but not just any superposition, their outcomes are perfectly linked. It's as if they're both zero and one at the same time, and when we measure one of them, without even measuring the second one, they'll both collapse to be the same state. This idea is called entanglement, and it's a powerful concept in quantum computing and quantum mechanics as a whole. So how can we represent this circuit mathematically? Well, let's take a step back to understand what our controlled knot gate, or C0, does. This is our first look at a two-qubit quantum logic gate, so let's see what's happening with both of our qubits. If the first qubit is a zero ket, then it does nothing. But if it's a one ket, then it's as if a knot gate is applied to the second qubit. So if it's a zero ket, it becomes a one ket, and vice versa. The first qubit is called the control qubit, because it controls whether we apply a knot gate to our second qubit, which is called the target qubit. We can represent this C0 gate with a 4x4 matrix. If you look closely, you'll notice that this is just the identity matrix up here, and this is the NOT gate down here, with the rest of the entries being zeros. It's as if we've somehow encoded that we're doing nothing with the first qubit, then applying a NOT gate to the second qubit only if the first qubit is a 1 ket. So we now have the tools to build the circuit mathematically. Let's start with a 0, 0 ket. The first thing we do is apply the Hadamard gate to the first qubit while leaving the second qubit untouched. To represent that, we'll use the identity matrix I. If you recall, this doesn't do anything, so we'll take the tensor product of both matrices. Remember, 
Our 0, 0 ket is 4-dimensional, so to represent the Hadamard gate acting on the first qubit while doing nothing to the second qubit, we need to encode both matrices into a single 4-dimensional matrix, and that's exactly what the tensor product does. Finally, we just need to apply the C0 gate. It's already acting on both qubits since it's 4-dimensional, so there's no need to add anything else. This result is actually so useful for quantum computing that it has a shorthand. Let's take a second to compute this equation mathematically. As expected, the 0, 0 ket and 1, 1 ket have probabilities of 1 half each, while the other terms don't appear at all since their coefficients are 0. Therefore, they had no chance of showing up in the distribution. Of course, this entire model can be extended to 3 qubits, with 2 to the power of 3, or 8 possible kets. To generalize this idea, an n qubit quantum computer's quantum state has dimensions of 2 to the power n. And generalizing the normalization constraint, the square of their coefficients must always sum up to 1. Before going, I just want to make a quick note on complex numbers. These coefficients can in fact be complex numbers, but what does that even mean? Aren't they related to probability? The truth is that they are. It's just, when dealing with quantum mechanics, we need to use imaginary numbers. When quantum computing is implemented in real life, we do so with quantum particles, which in turn use complex numbers to be described mathematically. If you'd like to learn more about this, I highly recommend Quantum Sense's series, The Math of Quantum Mechanics. He does an amazing job explaining the math and physics behind quantum mechanics. Alternatively, if you're more interested in why all of this matters, and how this translates to quantum computers beating classical computers at certain problems, then 3Blue1Brown's recent video on quantum computing focuses more on that. I highly recommend watching it as well, or even re-watching it if you already have, as this video might give you a fresh perspective on it. If computer science interests you, then I encourage you to subscribe, as I do plan on making more videos on math and computer science topics in the future. Thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something new.